uh, closely with the Distributed Biological Observatory, field sampling, works in the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, and has many achievements under her belt. And I think that's about all I'm going to say. But I would say in her discussion, ah, you took the agenda away for I can have the title. Her title of her talk is on underwater, underwater sound. And I'll just let you set that up. That's okay. And Sue, you could take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, yes, thanks uh, to all of you for uh, being on this call. Um, it's my pleasure, actually, to talk a little bit about underwater sound. It's really what got me into work in the Arctic many years ago. So in some ways, this is sort of a full circle for me. Um, before I get into the slides, I just wanted to give you a little background on how this particular presentation came to be. Um, earlier this year, in fact, in January, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center uh, was hosting a group to talk about developing an Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. Um, and this was done also under the auspices of PAIN that Kathy mentioned earlier, the Protection of Arctic Marine e Environment, which is part of Arctic Council. So Libby Lagerwell was uh, the chair for the U.S. Uh, part of this IEA meeting. And we met next door, and Libby asked me to come over just because she knew people from Utyagvik, formerly Barrow, uh, were going to be there, and that uh, it might be good if I showed up and chatted with them. So I did. And as this meeting got started about IEAs, and people were talking about describing the environment, the Arctic marine environment, nothing was said about sound or acoustics. And so Harry Brower looked at me across the room, and I looked at Harry, because we've been in so many meetings over the years about impact of anthropogenic noise, and that he was sitting in a meeting where they were talking about an integrated ecosystem assessment without bringing up sound was just crazy. So anyway, um, I started uh, a discussion then with Libby that led to this presentation, which I gave earlier this summer at an ESOS meeting. But the take home message, which I'll give you right away, is I think the science of underwater acoustics and ocean ecology, ocean acoustic ecology, is now mature enough that it really needs to be considered an element in IEAs. And uh, Kathy had already mentioned the uh, knowledge report from PAME, but um, this, this uh, maturity of underwater sound in terms of an ecosystem element is being recognized by the Global Ocean Observing System uh, Program. The International Whaling Commission just had a resolution on it in their meeting in Brazil um, earlier this month. So really the time has come that we really start beginning to think about sound when we think about ecosystem assessment. Um, with, with the first slide, the only thing I would point out is the, the other people in that slide, uh, Rebecca Schufer, Jason Gadamke, and Layla Hatch, they are really the worker bees at NOAA that do this. So Becky does IEAs. She leads the IEA program for the Marine Ecosystems Group at Office of Science and Technology, where I also work. And Jason leads the Ocean Acoustics Group. So they are your go-to people for IEA and ocean acoustics. Leela is with the sanctuaries. And this is kind of the test bed where NOAA is starting to try to actualize some of these tools uh, that I'll just be touching on today. So those three people are great resources for you going forward. Okay, next slide, please. So this is just a simple outline for the talk. I wanna say a few words about ocean soundscapes so that we're kind of all on the same page. There are three primary contributors to soundscapes. A little bit about long-term recorders in Arctic seas. Um, long-term meaning recorders that stay out over the course of a year and sample in all kinds of weather, dark. Um, it's really a robust sampling technique and we've had recorders out now in some places for over a decade. Then a little to the specifics about anthropogenic noise and its impacts to subsistence hunting and people that live along the coast. Um, and then jumping into commercial uh, shipping concerns mostly because that brings pain back into the picture in a big way. And then I'll try to wrap up with at least how I think uh, partnering with some of these groups that have been looking and working with sound for a number of years now might be the next best step to include sound in IEAs. Next slide, please. So quickly on ocean soundscapes. 
basically there are two components that are considered natural sources of sound. And one, the physical, comes from storms, sea ice, and volcanoes. And you might think that the, the ocean is a quiet place, but it's not. And in fact, um, PME lab, PMEL lab down in Newport tracks seismicity using sound, uh, especially in the Pacific Rim area. So you can listen to earthquakes underwater. It's, it's a technique that's been used for a long time. The hydrothermal vents make noise, rain makes noise. Um, so there are these physical attributes that are adding sound underwater all the time. Switching to the biological components, virtually all fishes, invertebrates, and mammals have the capacity to produce sound, and more importantly, perhaps, they listen for sound to understand their environment. Sound travels really well in the water, about four and a half times faster than it travels in air. It travels a long way. And so no surprise that evolutionarily, these animals rely on sound as a primary modality. Next slide. And then there's us and our activities. And this is really where the concerns come in. Shipping, offshore wind farms, offshore oil and gas platforms, they all produce sound underwater. Um, and at different levels and at different frequencies. Next slide. And this, this bar graph just gives you a general idea of the frequencies of these various sounds. So um, on the bottom, you see these two arrows, one that is encapsulating shipping, seismic surveys, pile driving. Those types of sounds are at the low frequency end, so less than one kilohertz. A hertz is one cycle per second, a kilohertz is a thousand cycles per second. That is considered low frequency sound, and that's where most of the shipping and seismic surveys occur. Um, at the other end, in the higher frequencies, uh, basically 15 kilohertz and above, those are man-made sounds uh, that are commonly used on all ships, uh, echo sounders, mapping, and sonars. And then you see the two Navy sonar systems, mid-frequency active sonar and low-frequency active sonar. So in a very quick summary, that is where the anthropogenic or man-made sound is entering the system. Now, as you read up, you can see that various animals have hearing that, is, that either overlaps or does, does not overlap uh, those areas. Basically, the dolphins and porpoises are high-frequency specialists, and the baleen whales and fishes are down at the lower frequencies. So when you're talking about impacts of sound on animals, it's important to, to ask who is your listener and who are you impacting? What species are you impacting? Next slide. So again, sound is critical to marine animals. Why? Hearing really is the most effective means of animals just gathering information about their environment because sound travels so well. It's also the most efficient way to communicate over uh, short and long distances. And the animals use sound on the right-hand side of this slide for, for all those things, to find food, locate uh, their mates, avoid predators, navigate. And the way we usually look at sound is that kind of funny looking uh, sketch there on the bottom, that's a spectrogram. And basically all that is showing you is how frequency progressions of calls, in this case, it's a uh, bearded seal uh, bumping sound that you see to the left, and then these high-frequency little trills that they do. Um, so this is the type of, of thing that people that work with sound are commonly looking at to see where sound may, may be uh, overlapping with man-made sound. We use those spectrograms. Next slide. So anthropogenic noise, people often ask me, is it noise or is it sound? Well, really it's all sound, and noise is generally thought of as unwanted sound. Um, and currently ocean noise is a growing global problem in marine ecosystems. Uh, that little slide to the right are ship tracks. They're, it's from AIS. AIS, it's not from acoustics. But you see global, just a snapshot of global shipping there. Uh, shipping is increasing worldwide, and it's, it's uh, projected to continue to increase. 
And then with regard to the Arctic, anthropogenic noise really uh, has been shown to impact uh, species that subsistence hunters rely upon. I would say in the last 30 years, in terms of impacts, we've really been focused on acute impacts. So a lot of funding has gone into uh, trying to respond to this issue. We do not want to impact uh, subsistence hunting. And so when these activities occur, such as seismic surveys in the Arctic, uh, there's been a lot of, of effort to try to determine how, how does that activity impact the animals and the hunt. More recently, and by that I mean in the last 10 years, we're kind of moving toward, uh, I think, a more holistic assessment of chronic impacts, where we're looking at how is raising the background noise levels impacting the ecology of a system. So it's a, it's a broader approach. It doesn't mean that looking at acute uh, problems is, is uh, not useful, that is useful, but trying to bring this science forward so that you're, you're approaching it as acoustic ecology is where we're trying to go. Next slide. So I just wanted to show you one map. There are many maps like this. This is from NOAA's Ocean Noise Strategy Program, the one that Jason leads. And we developed these maps. We had workshops and all kinds of things over a period of years from about 2005 to 2010 where we're trying to show in a broad sense that acoustic ecology. And I would just uh, have you note that the, uh, the blue colors are, are where it's quieter and the yellow, orange, red colors is where it's noisier. So you can see very simply that the Gulf of Mexico is the noisiest place we have. It's like a bathtub with noise just banging all around. And then offshore Alaska, especially north of Bering Strait, that, that's some of the quietest ocean. That we, that we have, and a big reason for that actually is sea ice. So this is an average over many months, uh, probably at least one year. It's focused at 100 hertz, so low frequency, um, and it, it's summed over long time period. So this just gives you a, a sense. It's not giving you a particular day or anything, but you can see that the Arctic is a pretty quiet place comparatively. A lot of that, again, is because when you have sea ice, it, it stops the interaction of wind on the sea surface, and that is a big, sur big uh, source of noise. But the Arctic is... Uh, Sue? Yeah? I have a quick question on that. Sure. Um, back in... This is Guillermo, by the way. Um, last April, we had a presentation by Manuel Castellote from NOAA, yeah. and he, yeah. he mentioned that with um, less sea ice, there will be less anthropogenic noise, and he showed a spectra comparing uh, the same situation with and without sea ice. So, and you seem to indicate the opposite. Um, where, where, what am I missing? I'm, I'm not exactly sure what uh, Manolo was speaking to, but I'm think I'm talking broad scale. When you take sea ice out of the equation and you have more wind and more storms, you are going to raise the ambient noise level. That is, wind on water is one of the main sources of that natural sound that I spoke of on the second slide. Um, that's where you get the winds curves and, and so on. So when I'm saying the loss of sea ice, I mean loss of sea ice over seasons. September in the Beaufort Sea is going to be noisier at low ambient noise levels. That floor is going to come up until the sea ice comes in in late October or November. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. I don't know how that crosswalks with what Manolo said. I, I think um, the, both of you could be right uh, and are probably right um, because he if I recall well, he was referring to vessel traffic and the sound source there, it's in the water. And you're referring to sound sources in the atmosphere, out, out, out of the ocean. Well, so yeah. with, with less, uh, I'm speculating, but with less sea ice, it will make sense to have less sound from shipping and more sound from sources 
in the atmosphere or, or nearby on land. Does that make sense? Yes, in a way. I guess I would phrase it that wind is a broad sound source that's going to affect at a basin level. So it's a matter of scale. I think with less ice, you will get more commercial shipping. And that means that you will get more sound from ships too. But that is on a more acute scale or a specific scale along the ship track. So I'd have to I'd have to check with Manolo the point he was trying to make. But quite frankly, with less sea ice, I think you're going to get more underwater noise from ships too. But it's too yeah. He was making his uh, spectral comparison was um, the same sound level, the same amplitude with uh, and without sea ice and and uh, I think uh, probably with more sea ice there was more uh, ref reflection and refraction uh, of the sound waves uh, underwater. Um, here, here, here Stan is saying yes, yes. Okay, uh, I, I guess I understand now. I can Thank you. We can talk later if you want, Guillermo. Sure, sure. And uh, also, by the way, Manolo's uh, presentation is on the IRPIC collaborations uh, website. Okay. It's back, back from April. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the point of this slide is the Arctic comparatively as a region is quiet, uh, but with the changes we're seeing, both physical and the influence of anthropogenic noise, it's poised to get noisier. Next slide. So just uh, one depiction of some long-term recorders. This is not a comprehensive map uh, provided by Catherine Fairchalk from the Marine Mammal Lab. But just to give you some sense of how many recorders are out and how some are co-located uh, with bio-oceanographic moorings, such as Phyllis Stabenow's mooring down in M2 and Southeast Bering Sea. Um, you have a lot of, of acoustic only moorings. Those are the green triangles uh, up in the Chukchi Sea, the stars. Again, you have uh, that co-located with um, moorings that also, in some cases, measure zooplankton. So many of these recorders, especially the ones in the western Beaufort Sea, have been out since 2007, Chukchi Sea since 2010. And they represent, again, only a partial depiction. There are recorders in the Beaufort Sea and internationally, uh, recorders in Davis Strait, Fram Strait, Canadian Arctic. Um, so we really are collectively uh, building quite a network of recorders to provide uh, better and improved soundscape. Next slide. Um, just a little bit of data from uh, recorders that went out during international polar year. Uh, we have one on the Chukchi Plateau, and we've been able to maintain that. So um, I'm excited that we're working on a paper to look at uh, what we've gotten at the Chukchi Plateau since IPY. We also have recorders in Fram Strait. So uh, back in 2012, we just put together a paper based on one year. Um, the top panel is the Chukchi Plateau. And uh, you'll see we got uh, consistent detections of bowheads and belugas out on the plateau from spring through summer, which was surprising to a lot of people. Um, we also picked up the air gunning signal. Those are the black bars uh, in the fall period when seismic surveys are common off Alaska. The bottom two panels are for Fram Strait. And you'll see it's a much busier place. It's a much busier place with marine mammals. We have the bearded seals. Uh, odontocetes, a variety of, of odontocetes, and bowhead whales. And we have those bowhead whales all through the year that we're recording in Fram Strait, also surprising to people. And then the bottom panel really is how uh, you also have the subarctic species there. You have fin and blue whales. This was surprising to people in Norway that we recorded those calls uh, on a seasonal basis. And then I would point out that the air gunning was virtually year round at that particular recorder. So again, from an acoustic ecology standpoint, next slide. You can see that actually the Chukchi Plateau had uh, fewer uh, species that were detected, bowhead, beluga, beard seal, and ribbon seal compared to Fram Strait. Um, and this gives uh, us all a better sense 
of timing of these animals in the ecosystem uh, gives us the capability to change how that phenology or timing of these mammals in the ecosystem is changing uh, with the changing environment. So again, acoustics, a very strong tool because it allows you that sampling um, all through the year. Next slide. So uh, turning now to anthropogenic noise and the impact to subsistence hunting, um, really the noise, oil, and gas seismic surveys and ships, but also research ships and commercial ships, uh, really has been the primary concern or primary focus, uh, at least in my experience. And that bowhead whale that's, that's swimming in uh, to this picture, um, again, that species and the hunt of that species really has driven so much of our, our research and uh, our, our efforts to try to uh, get a better handle on acoustics. Um, the primary focus of impacts to bowheads really has been since the 1970s. And I just point out there that the harvest is indeed managed by NOAA and AWC under international uh, uh, authority of the International Whaling Commission. Um, and this has really been a long, and I would say, although rocky at times, uh, successful collaboration over, you know, 40 years, basically. And it's been because we have been able to work effectively, for the most part, with uh, people in the communities, uh, with the AWC and, and others, uh, to try to come, come to some common ground. And that is why when Harry and I were at that meeting in January, we were looking at each other thinking, we can't let this part out of a story that is supposed to be about an integrated ecosystem. Next slide. So going back 10 years, uh, this is where we were at. So when I started, we were at the point of literally throwing sauna buoys out of airplanes and just getting acoustic recordings for an hour or two. Um, you fast forward 10, 15 years, and you have a lot of different entities putting recorders, now long-term recorders, into the water. But they're not talking to one another. So uh, this was from 2008 a lot of oil and gas activity going on in the Canadian Beaufort as well as the Alaskan Beaufort. All those different colored dots are recorders from different teams that were not necessarily talking to one another, nor did they even know where the other recorders were. And I just pulled this together. Um, you see in the legend, it's just set C, B, whatever. The, some of this was company information, so private information. Some of it was uh, government funded. But nobody wanted to uh, identify who they were. So this was really never published, but they okayed it that I could use it in talks. And this came to be because I was actually flying some surveys over in Canada with Lois Harwood, and one of, the, one of the oil and gas guys came up, and he was so pleased that they were putting in those green recorders, you know, that they, they were coming up to the times and look at all these recorders. And I said, well, that's really great. That'll bring the whole, the whole count up to about 100. And he said, well, no, you know, that he had no idea. So that's why I made this slide. And it was a step in the right direction, but there was no coordination really going on with the data coming in. And I think we can do better by including sound in the developing ocean observing systems and also by inclusion in integrated ecosystem assessments because that will push us to take this type of uh, science to the, to the next level. Next slide. So shipping uh, becomes uh, important, at least in my way of thinking, to this process because the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, uh, that AMSA, uh, AMSA program that PAME has been doing, has really kind of set the stage. I have a slide on that next. But the, the situation is such that you have these three primary shipping routes uh, that are sketched there on the left. And it's really the northern sea route um, that gets the most attention because it gets the most through through flow traffic. Much of the traffic in the, uh, in the on the green line there is destinational traffic, the Northwest Passage. In any case, uh, this year for the first time, through the Northern Sea Route at the bottom, there has been liquid national natural gas and the first uh, big container ship coming through. So this shap this traffic is going to increase. There's been a lot of focus on Bering Strait because it is such a, a choke point and concern uh, for possible uh, 
impacts there with regard to shipping, literal impacts and sound impacts. Next slide. So again, Arctic Council PAME, they've had this AMSA program for uh, a decade or about a decade. The first report came out in 2009. One of the reasons I like it is they have done a biannual update on how they're doing on their uh, on progress on on the things that they're setting out to do, and they have three themes. The first is in enhancing marine safety, and the last is building Arctic marine infrastructure. But I just wanted to focus on their second theme, protecting Arctic people and the environment, because as you'll see there in A through H, I think there are specific uh, and identified targets for where they want to make progress that, that really kind of would crosswalk very well with the IEA approach and possibly crosswalk with your goal 4.3.8 or perhaps performance elements in some of the other IARBIC teams. Again, this has reached a level of maturity because they've been working on this for 10 years through pain and indeed some of lessons learned here uh, has made its way into that knowledge report that Kathy Kuhn mentioned. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, a real kind of general wrap-up uh, slide to try to drive home the point that PAME, AMSA, and their now their program to develop an ecosystem assessment, the thing that Libby Lagerwell is leading, I think brings together these various elements the NOAA IEA cycle is what I'm showing there on the right, where you define ecosystem-based management goals, et cetera. But in that cycle, sound ocean noise needs to more routinely be brought in. NOAA has tools that's developed under the ocean noise strategy. I give the link there, again, Jason Gadamti. The US uh, Inter Integrated Ocean Observing System, the Alaska OOS, I've talked with Molly about this on a number of occasions. And then the goose, I will mention a little bit about those last two things in the, in the next couple slides. Next one. So a lot of words on this. This is a, a slide from Jason. I would just point out that this o ocean noise strategy is a long-term uh, program for NOAA uh, in the Office of Science and Technology. Um, it was started uh, back in the early parts of the Obama administration and has been moving forward. Key objectives one through four you see on the left, science, management, decision support tools, and outreach, of course. There, under this program, is now an active noise reference station. That's the map on the right. So each of uh, the regions at least has one, if not two, uh, long-term dedicated uh, recorders. And the idea is to uh, really focus on both science and management actions that support EBM. Next. Another busy slide, sorry for that, but uh, just wanted to point out that here very recently, and there's a couple articles uh, if you're interested, marine mammals and ocean sound have both been recognized as what they call essential ocean variables by the Global Ocean Observing uh, System Group, which is international. Um, so there's three panels in GOOSE, one is physics, one is biogeochemistry, and one is biology and ecosystems. That's the one in the black box. Um, and then you'll see how these EOVs, are they mature? Or is it a pilot or is it a concept? And you'll see in most of the biology and ecosystems, of course, it is still conceptual. But identifying marine mammals as essential ocean variables, again, sort of gives them a seat at the table in terms of uh, uh, looking at ecosystems in a holistic way. Ocean sound uh, really has been brought forward uh, as a topic and as an element by people that are working with the International Quiet Ocean Experiment, IQOE. They have their own website. And basically, Goose has handed off to that group uh, the job of actually developing the metrics, which is a complex job, especially if you're trying to reduce those metrics to something uh, simple and yet informative uh, to an ecosystem assessment. Next slide. So this is my last one, and it's just my pitch that sound there in the middle uh, really does bring together 
uh, key environmental factors from, from three worlds, if you will. Um, one is an ecology approach where you bring in the abiotic and biological ecosystem variability, uh, the ocean ecology, if you will. It brings in aspects of, of the economy and how, how economic activities on our end, shipping, resource extraction, and tourism, how they contribute to sound, and then the local community, uh, the, the importance of knowing how sound is impacting the animals uh, that, the, that the people are interested in and their activities vis-a-vis -vis that with regard to food security and Inuit knowledge. I really do think it's time that we include sound in the IEA cycle, so that's why I'm on this little soapbox. Um, I do plan to continue working with uh, not only the people that you saw on the front slide here, but there are various programs, uh, including at IWC, um, that I've been involved in over the years, and I do think it's really time that we can move this forward. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Sue, very much. So I guess we can open up um, for questions at this point. And uh, I guess my first one, Sue, is that, uh, is this incorporation of, for in the in the goose and the, one of the parameters, how long will this take before they actually agree to it? Well, they, they have agreed to it, Jackie. Okay. It's, now, it's now actualizing it. So uh, as I mentioned, there's a couple of papers. I'm working on this primarily with the Marine Mammal Commission. I'm a science advisor there. And Sam Simmons, who is their science lead at the commission now, she's had a really active role with that goose panel. Um, so it, they have identified both. If you go on the goose site, or, you know, it's like what's new and you'll see that both Water sound and marine mammals are now identified as EOVs, essential ocean variables. So that allows the group to take the next step, and I can hear workshops coming down the pike about how you actually do that. But they are accepted now. They're identified now, and the group has accepted that. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, yeah, this is Kathy, and I have one. Um, Sue, so there. There might not be an answer that you have to the question, but I still want to pose it to the group. Um, you know, Noah, I was had the opportunity to attend that uh, January meeting as well. Uh, that was a pain meeting on ecosystem approach to management, also known as EBM. Uh, and Noah gave some great presentations on the different integrated ecosystem assessments that they conduct uh, you know all over the country and, and the program is really robust. I know that um, when NOAA does some of the IEAs it has fisheries as a benchmark it's ecosystem based fishery management. Either you Sue or the group if we try to do an IEA for the Chukchi Sea or the Beaufort Sea, and there's currently no commercial fishing up there, um, do you think that there would be, um, a, you know, challenges to set some of those parameters, or you know, could we take some of the lessons from the EBF, EBSM approach into doing uh, integrated ecosystem assessment? That's a really good question, Kathy, and I'm probably not the best person, but, um, and I do remember you being at the January meeting, and I myself was pleased to see that Libby is now the person stepping up to lead for fisheries because uh, Libby has probably the, uh, one of the best senses anyway of how the Chukchi ecosystem is different than the Bering. Um, she's published on that. She was out there, one of the first from Alaska Fisheries Science Center, uh, actually doing surveys up there in 2008. So. I mean, I think the overarching goal, Kathy, is to be able to do an IEA, whether there's a commercial fishing activity or not, um, and to do it in a, you know, a framework that is recognizable. In other words, you don't do it differently because there's no commercial fishing. And I think Libby, that's one of the reasons Libby's at the helm there. Um, that said, uh, it comes as no surprise, I'm sure, to anybody on the phone that where the resources are in NOAA will still be going towards commercial fishing. So um, I would say that we want to establish a framework for IEAs that support EBM in my acronym speak. Uh, and I think that is the direction uh, that Libby's trying to do, to go as the US lead for that pain program. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, I agree that Lib Lib Libby at the helm is really going to help things out for the U.S. Um, and, and then I guess another uh, topic on that note that might be useful for uh, this collaboration team to undertake is under that PAME working group, they have six elements identified to proceed with an ecosystem-based management approach. And one of them is identifying the large marine ecosystems, which, which has been done. Um, but there's some fact sheets that are new and up on the PAME website for the large marine ecosystems of the Bering Sea and the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea. And I think it would probably be worthwhile um, that this group maybe uh, does a review of them and see if they're accurate or if we can provide any new uh, literature um, for that. And I'm happy to work with uh, Meredith or, or whoever to kind of get a, a, a list of those uh, fact sheets up for, for review and discussion. All right. Are there other questions of Sue? Yeah, this is Francis. Can you hear me? Yes. Go on, yeah. Hi. I wanted to make a comment and a question. One is, I guess, to your earlier point, Kathy, that I think that the an EIA type of framework that doesn't have to be fisheries Anyway, and I think actually it can be put in for different for different purposes. And you can, you know, the end point there, the frame of reference can be ecosystem structure, function things that don't have to be fisheries focused necessarily. So I think that's totally that will be totally doable and actually probably be a very good exercise uh, to pursue. Um, the so that was my comment to that. I had a question, Sue, um, in your presentation, and thank you very much for that. that you, one of your slides that. I have slide 13 or 14 where you showed all the, the buoys that are out there, that were out there in 2008. Um, there's obviously been more recent work. I mean, somewhat, you know, from on the Canadian side, there's a, in the Imperial Oil ones and those clusters and others. But um, as you probably know, with, with Mares, we have, um, yeah, the other one. Uh, Okay. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So we have we we partnered with Kate um, with Kate Stafford, and so on our Mars moorings, we'll have two years of year-round data. We have we had two PAMs on there the first year, and we have one this year. And the moorings are just going to come out here, in hopefully by the end of next week. So we'll have two years of that kind of fill that middle gap there. They're just they're off of Herschel Island, so they're right in the middle of. Uh, in that Eastern Beaufort area. And I, I totally agree that we need a, a synthesis there. So if that were to happen, we'd certainly be interested to contribute those data sets also. Yeah, thanks, Francis. Uh, again, this was just meant as a snapshot of how things were in 2008. There have been quite a few more deployments uh, kind of throughout the Beaufort and Chukchi since that time. Uh, but it's great uh, that you're willing to collaborate because that's exactly what we need. We need to bring the data from these assets uh, together. Yeah, I agree. And this is Jackie. I would just add on this map that's showing there now, I have been talking to some Canadian colleagues that have, I think they have, uh, I don't know if they have moorings on the ones off of Cape Bathurst, but I've seen two proposals uh, pending one to you. Uh, uh, you know, one of these groups, the ships, and use the Admonson to come over, and another, so that would ha would actually put in more moorings there and occupy that. So I, I hope we can pull pull together some connections and get the Canadian, you know, get the Canadian information on a map like this too. Yeah, that'd be great, Jackie. And, and uh, I like the idea, Kathy, that you had about reviewing those fact sheets. I, 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 don't, I didn't know that they were out already. I think that would be a great, uh, I don't know, Guillermo and Danielle, what you guys think, but I think that would be a great role for this group to do. Great. I already sent uh, Meredith an email, so we'll work on it. Great. Are there any other questions? Just so to remind everyone, uh, to remind everyone that this presentation is relevant to the new uh, performance element 4.3.8, um, which is addresses anthropogenic sound uh, in the Arctic. Good point. Thank you. 
So if there aren't any more questions, I want to thank you, Sue, for the time and the presentation. It was excellent. And I will turn the meeting over to back to Meredith. OK, great. Thank you, everyone. I think um, unless anyone has any um, final comments or updates that they remember now, we can go ahead and end the meeting a little bit early. Meredith, this is Danielle Dixon. Um, I also wanted to echo the thanks, Sue, for the really wonderful presentation. And I just wanted to mention to uh, folks uh, on the phone that we're working on setting up a series of two crossover talks with the modeling uh, team for IARPIC. And so um, the October call may potentially uh, occur during the modeling team's normal time, which I believe is um, the third Thursday of the month. Um, at 11 a.m. Alaska time. I believe it's October 25th. Is that right, Meredith? That sounds correct, yes. Okay, so we're, we're working on the details now, but the idea is that the modeling team would take the lead on the first call and um, look at some of the um, state-of-the-art um, ecosystem models that, are, uh, that either exist or are under development. And then the marine ecosystems team would take the lead on a November call, and we hope that many of the modeling folks will participate in our call. And we'll look at where there are um, biogeochemical data, especially some of the more upper trophic level biological data that could potentially um, feed into some of these models and discuss um, further model development opportunities to make the modeling community aware of the data sets that um, our scientific community is collecting um, data from things like the Distributed Biological Observatory, et cetera. So I hope that many of you will join us for those two calls and Meredith will be sending out details uh, pretty soon. Thanks so much. Thank you, Danielle. Okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. Thank you, Sue, again for the excellent presentation and um, we'll be following up and see you all next month. Okay. Thanks, Bear. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.